One of the most difficult things for any of us to deal with is the pain of betrayal. We've all been betrayed at some point in our lives by people that we have been in relationship with. Chances are your betrayal hit you the same way that a betrayal or many betrayals have hit me. Really a gut punch. Like oftentimes we're betrayed by those that are closest to us and we're, we're stuck in this quagmire of how could you do this? I, I thought we were closer than this. I can't believe this is happening to me. Well, today we start a new series called The Great Betrayal, where we are looking at the greatest of all betrayals in history, the betrayal of Jesus Christ. Let's dive in. Hey guys, it's Pastor B here from Forward Church. Welcome to Church Online. I'm glad you're here hanging out with us. Today, we are looking at the betrayal of Jesus as portrayed in Mark chapter 14. Mark 14 verses 26 and following says this, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy and they did not know how to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. This portion of God's word really is coming toward the end of what's been referred to as Passion Week. Passion Week marks the week when Jesus enters into Jerusalem as he makes his way to the cross. Passion, really, the definition of the word means suffering. That's the original meaning of that word. And so this is the end of Passion Week. Jesus has been spending time in the temple teaching, being confronted with the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders. And now they've hatched the plot alongside of one of his closest disciples, to take Jesus and crucify him. Now, from this ver- these verses of Scripture that I've read today, 
we see what the heart of the gospel is. And really, the heart of the gospel boils down to this. Humanity is sinful and frail, and only God can fix and redeem humanity. See, when I look at this passage of Scripture, I see a handful of things. I just want to share them with you today. And and really, the first one is, is I want to look at the perspective of Peter and the other 11 disciples. Now, Jesus had 12 disciples, and one of them was Judas, and we'll get to him a little later. But before we do, let's look at the other 11 disciples. Now, they've just finished the Passover meal where Jesus has taken the cup and taken the bread and said, this is my blood and this is my body that will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. And they sing a hymn, and now they're going towards Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane is a garden on the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. And as they're going there, Jesus prophetically tells them that they're going to fall away from him. He actually quotes the prophet Zechariah, and he says that the shepherd will be struck and all the sheep will be scattered. But notice what Peter, the spokesperson for the disciples, says. Absolutely not. We will not betray you. Now keep in mind, at the Passover feast that they had just had, Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And they even say at that meal, we're not going to betray you. I think it's interesting the times in my life when I've argued back with God. I've acted as if God doesn't know what he's talking about. And I'm like, no, God, I'm different this time. No, God, I can handle this. If you'll bless me with this, I'll be able to live the way that you want me to. When the truth is, God knows the depravity and the frailty of my heart. Peter, alongside with these other disciples, they're emboldened, saying, even if we have to die with you, we're not going to deny you. Yet Jesus knows the condition of their hearts. Let me tell you that the truth is our heart is wicked. Now, here's this kind of double-edged sword that we have to deal with. We have an evil and a wicked heart that has been removed and replaced with a new heart by Jesus. That's what happens when you get saved or when I get saved. God removes the old heart and he puts a new spiritually refreshed and reborn heart in us. However, that new heart is within a sinful fleshly body. And so while it's popular in our culture to say things like follow your heart or trust your heart, the reality is our hearts can lead us astray. And have you ever noticed that one of the easiest people to fool is yourself? That we lie to ourselves all the time. I'm going to start my diet on Monday. I'm going to start saving money one of these days. You know, I'm going to go back to school and finish my degree. We lie to ourselves all the time. One more chapter, one more episode. We fool ourselves all the time because our heart leans away from God. Peter and these other disciples, they boldly say to Jesus, even if we have to die with you. And if you look, you'll see in verse 31, it says that he says it emphatically. And they all said the same. See, this isn't something that's just isolated to Peter. This is something that all true disciples, yourself and myself included, have to come to terms with. We all have a heart that wants to do what's best and a heart that wants to follow after Christ. But honestly, we have to come to terms with the depravity of our own heart. Truth is, the Bible says there's none righteous, not one. Now, I know you're thinking, well, I'm a good person, Brian, and I'm not as bad as so-and-so, or at least I don't do this. Guys, we all have this sinful flesh that we have to battle with and we have to wrestle with over and over and over again. One of the greatest leaders in the New Testament was a guy by the name of Paul, and Paul actually traveled all over the Mediterranean world sharing the gospel of Jesus, yet time and time and time again, Paul would make statements like this. The very thing that I don't want to do is the thing I end up doing. The things that I want to do, those are things that I I don't do. And who will save me from this body of death? Then he goes on to say, thanks be to God who delivers us through Jesus. See, we, we just see that there's this biblical reality that 
All of us are sinful. And even on our best days, our best days are not good enough. And the gospel came, the story of the gospel, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, who came to bear your sins and bear my sins, came so that he could fulfill what was lacking in ourselves. We try to be bold and we try to be brave and we try to be spiritual and holy and religious and boldly declare, even if I have to die for you, Jesus, I will not deny you. Yet the reality is that we all have a denier living on the inside of us. And that's our sinful nature. And so I just want to encourage you when you read this section of scripture, don't just read it as something that was happening to them, but really see yourself in these disciples that will betray. They say, we're going to go to death with you. Yet the very next moment we see, they can't even stay awake with Jesus. See, they go into Gethsemane and Gethsemane is a garden. Like I said, on the East side of Jerusalem, on the Mount of Olives and Gethsemane is interesting. The name Gethsemane actually means an olive press. Now, they're on the Mount of Olives, and there are olive trees all over Israel. And the thing about olives is olives would be put in what's referred to as a press. And a press basically was this heavy stone that would go over the olives. There was a trough built down up under it, and when the stone would go over the olives, oftentimes there would be a a long pole that would be connected to either a donkey or a handful of servants, and they would walk around in circles around this press, constantly pressing down on these olives. Now, the oil that would run out of the olives would run down the trough, would be collected. Now, this is pretty pretty interesting, is that there were three presses of olives. The first press is what we would refer to as extra virgin olive oil, and it was the most holy, the most pure of the oil. And that oil would typically be sent to Jerusalem to burn the lanterns, the menorah inside the temple, and to to be set apart for sacred usage. Well, then the second time that they would crush those olives, that would be the next press. And that next press would often go into homes to light lanterns in homes, and it could be used for medicinal purposes. Then the third press, when they did it the third time, that was more common usage, and it would sometimes be used in soaps and sometimes be used in common homes. So Jesus is in the olive press of Gethsemane. That's literally what the word means. And we see that three times he goes to the Father and is being pressed in his prayer. One of the things that we see in Mark chapter 14 here is we see the humanity of Jesus. Jesus goes to pray, but notice the words that he says to his disciples before he goes. He says to them in verse 32, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. We see that Jesus in his humanity is struggling with what awaits him. Here's something that I see whenever I zoom out and look at this account as a whole. I see these disciples who are boldly saying they will do anything for Jesus. Yet the very next breath, I see Jesus, who is very God in the flesh, struggling with being able to fulfill the call of God. Friends, when you look at religions, when it comes to world religions, what you will see is that World religions have gods that are disconnected, disinterested, and are higher than you and higher than me. And they demand that you come to them or that you be perfect to make it where they are. Whereas when you look at Christianity and you look at Jesus, what you see is God didn't demand you to come to him, but God who went to you and who wrestled and who struggled on our behalf. Three times he goes to the Father and he prays, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And that cup is a picture of this symbolic judgment of God. You see that in the Old Testament often, that God will be pouring out of the cup of his wrath and his judgment. And what Jesus is about to do at the cross is receive the wrath and the judgment of God for the sins of all humanity. And the weight of this is almost crushing him. As a matter of fact, we see that he is the pure olive being crushed in the olive press of Gethsemane. Yet what happens? He goes back to these disciples and three times they're asleep. 
I love the irony of this, that earlier in Mark's gospel, Jesus is with his disciples in a boat, and they're going across the Sea of Galilee, and this huge storm comes up, yet Jesus is sleeping in the boat. (laughs) And the disciples wake him up, and they say, don't you care that we're about to perish? And Jesus, he he rebukes them for their, their lack of faith. See, Jesus was sleeping there and they thought that he didn't care. Yet here in this moment when Jesus needs them the most, they are sleeping. He says they didn't have anything to say to him. They, they realized they were caught. They were, we, we said we're going to die with you, but we, we can't even stay awake. And Jesus goes back three times praying to the Father, wrestling with this. And if the first part of the gospel that I said from this was that we're all depraved and we're all sinful and we all have this propensity to, to walk away and deny God, Here's really the good news. The good news is that what we aren't faithful to do, God is faithful to do. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's wrestling with the call of God to be the Savior of the world, yet he follows through with it. Jesus has this beautiful end to his prayer when he says, Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. See, we see in Jesus, the Son of God, perfect submission to the will of God. Guys, I wish I could tell you that my life was a life of constant, perfect submission to God, but I still have a lot of rebellion inside of me that God's constantly having to work out of me. But thank God that Jesus was the perfect, not only did Jesus live the perfect, uh, not only did Jesus die the death for me perfectly, but he also lived life for me perfectly in perfect submission to God. See, the heart of the gospel is that you and I cannot do it our own and only God can. And he did that through sending Jesus. And something else here that's worth mentioning as well. Humanity was doomed in a garden, the Garden of Eden. Now humanity is being redeemed in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is referred to in the New Testament as the last Adam. The last Adam came to fix and redeem what the first Adam ruined. Thank God for Jesus. And we see on that third time, he goes back to his disciples and he's like, it's enough. My betrayer is here. And Judas comes with this group of soldiers and they've got clubs and lanterns and torches and and they come out to take him. and, And when they do, we see that one of the disciples takes a sword and cuts the ear of the high priest's servant off. Now, One of the other Gospels tells us that it's Peter. And I often wonder if maybe Peter was feeling a little guilt, right? After all, it was Peter who said, I'm not going to deny you, and yet Peter's the one who's asleep. I often wonder if if in that moment he's like, I I can fix what I did wrong, and he tries to cut off the the, the servant's uh, head. So here's what we know. Peter was just wildly swinging that thing. He wasn't aiming for his ear. He was aiming for his head, but his aim was off. And I see often this parallel between my life, because here's what I do. I find these betrayal moments with Jesus, these moments where I struggle with my own sin, or these moments where I see that I'm falling short of of the standard that God has for me. And here's what I always do. I always overcompensate. I'm always like, you know what, God, Uh, I messed up today, but tomorrow I'm going to read the entire gospel of John. Or, you know, I'm going to pray for an hour tomorrow. And and, and every day this week, I'm going to pray for an hour. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, and you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to fast for three days. I'm not going to eat any food. And for the next three days, I'm just going to be like overwhelmed with Jesus. So that's what we do. We tend to overcompensate when we realize that we've failed. And the truth is, is that in this moment, their humanity was being shown just as much as Judas's humanity was being so, being shown. And what we have to realize is no amount of overcompensation will do for us what only Jesus can do for us. And so I want to encourage you, friend, rest in the work of God. See, Jesus confronts these guys. Why are you coming out to attack me now? Why are you coming out to arrest me? I was with you teaching in the temple and you didn't deal with me then. And and this is the sly way of Jesus saying, I know you're doing this underhandedly. But notice that Jesus says, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. See, Christ had, although he struggled very humanly with the will of God in this situation, he trusted that God's word would be fulfilled and God's word would sustain him. See, we see 
the perspective of Peter and these other disciples. They, they denied Jesus. They couldn't stay awake. They were weak and faithless. And then Judas comes in and Judas is simply evil. His heart is wicked and he's doing whatever he can in order to betray Jesus. We see Peter overcompensating and trying to earn his rightful place back in the good graces of God. But we see Jesus fully surrendering to the will of God. And I think it's interesting how this whole thing ends up by saying that there was a young man who was following them and they reached out and they grabbed the young man's outer garment and he fled naked. Just before that, we read the verse before that, that all of the disciples fled away from Jesus, fulfilling the prophecy that if you strike the shepherd, the sheep will flee. And at the very end, we see that not only did those that were his 12 fleeing from him, but also there's this unnamed man who runs away naked. And I, I go back to the Garden of Eden when they were naked and unashamed. And one of the first things that happened when they sinned was they realized that they were naked and insecurity and overcompensation comes into the human race. They take fig leaves and they sew them together to cover themselves up. Yet here we see this young man running away in the shame and the nakedness of who he is. And that's what our sinful nature does, guys. It causes us to be exposed and to run away in shame. I want to encourage you. We see in this great betrayal the Son of God trusting in the will and the plan of God, believing in the fulfillment of the Scriptures of God, and ultimately, as he walked this out, he will make his way to the cross for your sins and for mine. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of that sin is death. And let me tell you, if you don't have a life-giving, redeeming, sin-forgiving relationship with Jesus, your eternity is an eternity of death separated from God forever. And I want to encourage you. The Bible teaches us that all who will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter the Apostle will go on to say on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And so I want to call on you. I want to plead with you. If you've yet to trust Christ as your Savior, let today, let this moment be the moment where you repent of your sins. That word repent literally means to turn away from them, to change my mind and my actions and my attitude towards sin, to confess my sinfulness and my need for the saving power and grace of Jesus, and to follow him in all the moments of your life. Well, maybe you have been watching this video and you are a follower of Jesus. I want to encourage you as well to continue to trust in that grace that saved you to be the grace to empower you to fulfill faithfully the call of God on your life. See, we've all denied Jesus. We've all fallen asleep in Gethsemane. We've all ran away naked. But thankfully, our connection to God is not based on what we've done, but based on what he has done. And so today, the Lord is drawing you near and drawing you home. And my prayer and my pleading with you is to open your heart to Him. My prayer, my pleading with you is instead of running away, run toward Him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us to run to you. Thank you, Jesus, for enduring what you endured in Gethsemane. Thank you for dealing with the betrayal, the greatest of all betrayals. God, I can't begin to imagine what that felt like, but I am so eternally grateful that you endured that for me on my behalf. And so, Lord, I pray for those watching this video, and I pray for myself. I pray for Forward Church and for your church, the Capital C Church, that you would bring us back to you. Let us acknowledge our depravity. Let us acknowledge our sinfulness and let us acknowledge and cry out our need for our Savior. And Lord, as you save us and work that salvation out inside of us, I pray that we would be people that live on mission to bring that hope to others. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, thank you for sticking with me. I want to say uh, that I'm very encouraged by you being a part of our ministry of Forward Church, Your Church. 
Now, as a part of this ministry, I want to ask you to humbly consider to financially support us. Now, our mission is to help people move forward with God. And one of the ways that we've been doing that has been investing in our online ministry. We've been really working intentionally to try to spread the gospel out via digital means. We've done Facebook Live. We have a YouTube channel that we're putting out content on. And we are trying to increase that. And one of the ways that you can help us to do that is by partnering with us financially. Now, you could give a one-time gift or you could give a recurring gift that happens monthly or weekly or bi-weekly, however you feel the Lord laying it on your heart to do that. But I want to ask you, help us reach as many people as possible. See, this is what I've learned. Many of us can't go physically, but our money can go where we can't go. And my prayer, I say this all the time and I say it to us every week, is that we would take every bit of money that comes into this ministry and send it on God's mission. And so I'm asking for you to partner with us to spread the gospel of Jesus, the teaching of his word, as far as the internet will allow us to go. And as you partner with us to see this vision come to pass, I promise you, you will be a link in the chain of the salvation of many souls as the word of God goes forth and the gospel goes out. So thank you for giving. Thank you for supporting Forward Church, your church. I love you. We'll see you next week as we continue this series on the great betrayal. Bye, guys.